Well, hello, everyone. It's uh, great to see such a packed hall. And I will be talking about the global picture of antifungal resistance. Here's my real t title. Um, the backdrop to this session is the emerging diseases caused by fungi are increasing around the world. Uh, I encourage you to go and look at this recent edition of the Phil Trans that details a number of articles uh, from a recent discussion meeting we ran um, looking at fungal threats to animal, plants, and humans. And today we'll be focusing on a special case of an emerging threat, which is antifungal resistance. But first of all, these are the people I need to acknowledge because nothing happens in isolation, and especially here, this incredible Imperial College fungal group that's really got some, um, some growth behind it these days with uh, Darius and Silke doing the clinical aspects. But also that I'm gonna be talking about work from the public health groups, Trinity Co College, um, the Netherlands, Aberdeen, and St. George's. And of course, um, so uh, Gilead have funded a lot of this work and the Antimicrobial Research Collaborative and Imperial have been uh, sponsoring our fellows. So increasingly, we're seeing numbers of fungal outbreaks across recent decades. And this is really quite an overwhelming problem. I mean, we're losing biodiversity on a massive scale due to emerging fungal infections. Amphibians around the world are the most threatened vertebrate taxa due to chytrids exploding upon the scene. That white nose disease is burning across North America. There are many other examples in the wildlife. Plants aren't exempt. We're losing forests. Think of ash dieback. And here we have the massive loss going on in crops as we lose the ability to, uh, to, to feed many hundreds of millions of people as uh, we have breakdown caused by resistance and new virulent varietals. And then we're seeing changing patterns of disease in humans as well. So these are all linked. They're part of big anthropogenically driven processes, increasing trade, changing climates, changing patient populations. It's a very, very interesting area. And basically, when you look through time to the 1990s up to present, this is from the ProMed Disease Alert database, there's more disease now than there used to be caused by fungal, fungi in relative proportions to any other class of pathogens. So this is something that we need to keep our eye very closely on. So antimicrobial drug resistance, of course, is a huge problem, and the O'Neill report set that out in very hard language and gener generated an enormous amount of interest and funding. However, when you look at this, this money is very much targeted at the prokaryotes, and as we know, we're thinking about a eukaryote here, fungi. And there's, an over, there's a perception out there that I believe is true that there, uh, fungal resistance is not a problem. And we hope to convince you this morning that it is. And there's a bias here, and this is actually a neglected problem. Antifungal resistance is really neglected. You're, we're excluded from a lot of the money that the O'Neill report has generated. We have to find alternative ways of funding this research. So we're dealing with antifungal drugs. Many of you in the audience know far more about this than I do. But broadly, there are four classes of antifungal. There's the polyenes, the nucleic acid synthesis disruptors, fly foods, phytosine, and those that disrupt cell wall biosynthesis, echinocandins, and then these membrane ergosterol biosynthesis, the azoles. And these azoles are what I'm going to be focusing on and what Jacques is going to be delving into in more depth in the next um, talk. So the azoles um, target this uh, wonderful enzyme, CYP51, uh, as part of the um, nanosterol um, uh, synthesis pathway, and it's a cytochrome P450. And so this enzyme, uh, the, the az azoles uh, dock with um, um, CYP51 and disrupt its function. And the problem is here that all fungi have CYP51, and so az azoles work really well, so they're deployed on a monumental scale. So this is, an azo this is the, a list of um, a map, a spatial map, of how fungicides are deployed across the British countryside. I should encourage you to visit the UK Environmental and Health Atlas project run um, from Imperial, because it's a really, really good atlas. And it has maps such as this, but for many other background threats that are involved in chronic disease. But 
What's important here is that since 2000, we've seen a six-fold increase in applications of azoles on crops, basically to target the fungi that, uh, that, 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 that um, uh, 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 infect these crops. And we spend a quarter of a million kilos of azoles in the British countryside every year. You're in London, nothing's sprayed here, but that's because we haven't got any plants. It's all bricks. What is the mean result of this dumping of azoles onto the countryside? Well, it's, uh, you know, these, these, these uh, fungi have um, large, uh, enormously large populations. And the number of pop, um, polymorphisms in the genome, and I'll show you some genomic data later. But these polymorphisms, if they confer resistance to azoles, are obviously going to sweep up in frequency. And this is, of course, what happens. You know, Darwin was right. Populations respond to natural selection. And these are high-frequency polymorphisms in fungi that affect all of these crops. So this is a very clear and obvious trend. So this is some, just so you can kind of get uh, even more familiar with uh, what SIT51 looks like. This are uh, um, some very lovely structural models that are being produced by people in our group, group Anthony and Joe. And you can see how this uh, enzyme is docked into this membrane and then what happens is that you have the azole going here, and this disrupts uh, the enzyme function. Now, this is blue here's wild type, and this is a single polymorphism, L98, which changes the uh, uh, conformation of this enzyme significantly and, uh, and, 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 uh, and, ba and basically disrupt. It, it narrows the docking pocket so that the azole doesn't bind anymore. You have resistance from that single SNP. So those structural polymorphisms are important in conferring resistance. But what generally has to happen is you confer, if you have to link them to some uh, um, polymorphism in the promoter, which are these tandem repeats. There's two very common ones, TR34 and now TR46. And what these do, these boost the expression of um, of, 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 uh, of CYP51. Um, CYP so when you link these TR34L9TH together with t um, uh, the structural and the, the boosting um, uh, 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 promoter region, then you get very high-grade resistance. So resistance to azoles was rare. Um, it was first picked up by this paper by David Denning's group. And um, these patients were American, and this occurred back in the 1980s. What we're seeing nowadays is that when you go and you search in the environment for um, isolates of Aspergillus fumigatus, that you find that they have very high frequencies of these azole resistance polymorphisms. So these are some maps that Darius put together um, for a recent Cape Town meeting. But essentially what you're seeing here is that Aspergillus fumigatus out in the environment is got a very high frequency of resistance. And even in areas where we thought there was no azole resistance, we're starting to pick up on this. So this is recent CDC data on North America. So there's very widespread distribution of resistance out there in the environment. So what does this mean from the point of view of clinical patients? Because we get infected by aspergillus. It's out there. We inhale it with every breath. It establishes in the clinically susceptible populations, but then how does it respond to treatment? So this is a, um, a van der, the Van der Linden study, and they surveyed a broad multi-center trial um, uh, uh, surveillance from across Europe, and you see a number of countries are reporting azole resistance. Uh, the UK uh, um, put in 13 into this study. TR34, TR46 is found in many countries, but not in the UK. So these clinical patients don't have this environmental resistance motif. So here comes Ali, a PhD student and clinical mycologist in London with a, a, a recent surveillance that he's done across um, a London cohort of uh, respiratory pa patients with respiratory disease. And uh, what Ali's uh, pretty stunning contribution here is that he's uh, collected a number of isolates of, uh, of Aspergillus fumigators, and he's put them into this pipeline where he's screening them for resistance to three, um, three, three azoles, posiconazole, voriconazole, and nitroconazole. And then he confirms this using UCAS microbroth dilution, 
And if they're resistant, he subjects them to a test for whether or not they have these environmentally associated motifs. And these are now being entered into a whole genome sequencing pathway. So what has Ali found? He's found that TR34 is found in um, six out of 22, that's uh, over a, a quarter of these resistant infection, uh, these, these patients which are contributing isolates with azole resistance. So this environmentally associated mutation is occurring in this, in this clinical cohort. And these are primarily in cystic fibrosis patients. So you can see over here, I think he found 16 out of the 22 are from patients with cystic fibrosis. I really, really love this um, little plot here. So this is sputum from the patients, and this is where Ali is getting his azole-resistant isolates from. So here you have patients with cystic fibrosis, which are infected with an isolate of aspergillus fumigatus, presumably acquired with its, pre with its azole resistance from the environment, that's then potentially shedding it back into the hospital environment. So I think this is something that really needs to be explored further. So clearly, there is TR34 um, in these patient populations. We need to ask the question, is it really not there in the UK environment? So there's a multi-center surveillance of azole resistance that's kind of gently gathering speed. And uh, Cardiff have uh, sprung into the lead here by um, doing, um, this is Lewis White, who's off skiing, but they've done a very nice survey there. So if you can grab your clickers and just answer this question one or two, is TR3446 environmental azole resistant widespread in the UK environment? If you could vote on that, please. So this is a, a kind of a Brexit referendum question because obviously the, uh, the, the, the answer will lie in between um, these two points. So most of you think that it is there, but actually quite a significant proportion of you think that it isn't. Well, the data, can we have the next slide, please? That, um, Lewis White's group has uh, shown is that yes, it is an environment, and they're, they're pulling it out of these potato fields in southern Wales. So the question then becomes, yes, we have this, this resistance out there in the environment. We have also seen in cystic fibrosis patients in central London, what is the link? And that's really, really um, important to answer, because there may be no risk with azole resistance environment, or there may be high risk. So to make those epidemiological link linkages, you need, to you need to have a very good barcoding technique. And what's better than barcoding the entire genome of your organism? So this bullseye plot is depth of coverage plots for 24 um, isolates of fumigators that Ali and Joe have sequenced. And what this has found is that there is a lot of diversity out there in Aspergillus fumigators. So these are UK isolates and you can see them over here and over here in the phylogeny. But there's this, rather, this kind of dumbbell shape that you see emerging here. And what you can spot is that these TR34 mutations are all over here, apart from one there. So there's a lot of diversity, but there seems to be gen a genetic barrier in there. This you know, could potentially be interpreted as, a clinic, as, as, two, as two cryptic species, maybe. But what's the best evidence from this initial genome sequencing data that environmental resistance and clinical resistance are linked is from India, where you find near as, as near as damn it genetically identical isolates in the patients and in the environment across this, this uh, uh, almost 30 million bases of DNA. So there appears to be a linkage. And what's also more interesting is you can only really explain this pattern of high relatedness across many thousands of kilometers of India um, as, without inferring selection. That as the single genotype has become very highly selected for in this environment and is swept through the environment, but also swept into patients. So how would this uh, TR34 and L98 mutation move over here? Well, it would be through recombination. So fumigatus is something that will mate in the environment. So potentially, what we're looking here is a single origin of this mutational combination that's in this part of the tree that's slowly sweeping through the rest of the Aspergillus um, population genome. It's going through selective events in places like India and it's being moved around by recombination. So this is really what we need to understand about the populations of this fungus on a global basis.
Now, people like uh, Jacques have been collecting many thousands of isolates of fumigators from around the world, and it's with these that we're going to be able to genome sequence and then explore where the time of origin of these mutations, where they may have occurred, and how they're moving around. Because this is a highly aerosolized organism. The world is its playground. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's in the air. It presumably gets moved across many thousands of kilometers. Um, there is also a perception that the Netherlands is the heart of darkness for uh, the evolution of azole resistance. And this, is, again, is um, a myth that we'll either be able to debunk or prove using this sort of data. And finally, we're very excited about this experiment which started last week, where we've put a Burkhard seven-day air sampler on the roof of St. Mary's. And just behind Jen there is Alexander Fleming's window, where that famous uh, uh, isolate of penicillium chrysogenum swept in through the window and kick-started the antimicrobial revolution. So we're going to be doing Alexander Fleming's uh, experiment across three years um, on a day-by-day uh, -day basis. And these, are, these, these tapes are going to get searched for uh, azole-resistant fumigators. And what's really interesting is we're linking with Rothamsted Research here to match these Bur this Burkhards with Poland, Nijmegen, and Rothamsted, where they've all been running, running for a number of years now. So we're going to get a truly good picture of what, how much azole resistance is in the air and what seasonal patterns are, especially in central London for this, uh, where, of course, there's a very high density of clinically um, interesting patients. So I'll just take you through some kind of technological advances, which I think are important from looking at antifungal resistance. Our ability to sequence whole genomes worth of DNA now is unparalleled with these USB stick sequences called nanopores. And we've just shown that, this is, uh, uh, that, that we, can, we can actually use these very novel disruptive technologies in an outbreak setting. So work um, by Silker and colleagues has, uh, has shown that this uh, terrifying new fungal emerging infectious disease, I mean, this, is, this, this was first, uh, Candida aureus was first seen in 2009, and now it appears to be everywhere. This is something that will be talked about later on in the meeting. And it's, uh, it, got, it got into intensive care units in the Brompton. So what um, is interesting about Aorus is it is innately appears to be, have high-grade resistance. So even for Casper fungin, you've got this high-grade resistance, as well as for fluconazole and boriconazole. There's a very nice new paper out showing that this phenotype is, um, is manifested by biofilms of Candida Aorus. So um, only the, uh, the amphotericin amphoter appears to, uh, to, be, uh, to be working at the moment. What we're able to do using the nan nanopores is to sequence the genome of Candida auris very rapidly and to get a very nice genome assembly. We've got 157 contigs. We've got this down even further now. And we've, let's see, we're getting read lengths of up to 32,000 bases here with these nanopore devices. And so, you know, this is really almost, you can imagine a future in the next five years or so where you're going to have these devices reading uh, the genomes of these of, of fungal infections at the bedside. I mean, that future is not far off. Um, this, uh, what this uh, nanopore combined with Illumina sequencing showed was that the Brompton outbreak was very, the isolates were very, very closely related to one another. So this could be interpreted as a single introduction of Aorus into the Brompton or the introduction of very, very similar um, highly genetically related isolates. There's only 400 SNPs here on the scale bar. But there is heterogeneity in phenotype because posiconazole resistance appears to be different across different isolates. So this is something that, of course, we can explore using this whole genome data that's being generated from the outbreak. So um, working with some data from um, uh, uh, Tom's group, Chiller's group in the CDC, we, can find, we found that the Brompton Seoris outbreak is linked to isolates of Indian and uh, Pakistani origin. So at the moment, there appears to be some physical connection between those parts of the world and the intensive care units in London. Um, and this is something that clearly needs to be explored further. But there, are, there is polymorphism for resistance in CYP51 in these isolates of Candida auris that we're picking up on the sequencing. So it's going to be very challenging and exciting to explore whether or not the arise of Candida auris is a feature of its drug resistance, and it's been selected in, uh, by, by, by anti azole and antifungal therapy in wards, which is causing its global rise. Um, I mean, certainly this phylogeny 
point towards multiple origins of this organism. It's, it's quite a hard um, uh, uh, pattern to uh, interpret at the moment, but Tom will say more about that. So I've talked about azole resistance in the environment. I've talked about it in, um, uh, in, in, um, in, in an outbreak setting. The final example here is how it, de it develops de novo in a patient infection through time. And again, genome sequencing is giving us some very interesting insights here. So what we've done here is gone into a Cape Town cohort of uh, patients with HIV who have got relapsed cryptococcal infections. So cryptococcus neoformans like aspergillus is something you acquire from the environment. But patients are treated and then they get sick again. So the mean relapse here is 130 days, but some patients had their relapse four or five, uh, 500 days into the future. So uh, I've managed to put timings into this. Um, what this has shown is that the, basically most relapses accumulate SNPs on about six per day. So this is the phylogeny of the isolates that was recovered. And it, these, are, the, these, isolate, these patients have very genetically diverse infections, which is what you expect for patients from Africa, because Africa is a, a hotspot for cryptococcus neoformans diversity. Um, but what, what you can see here is that uh, this relapse genome, of the 17 relapse isolates, three quarters of them had acquired resistance to fluconazole and voriconazole. So they're building up, they're responding to treatment and they're building up resistance in vivo in the patient. Um, we also found that one patient had been infected with a mixture of isolates from a mating event in the, out, out in the uh, environment. And then we found this extremely interesting pair of isolates where they were picking up 1,000 SNPs a day as opposed to five SNPs per day. And this had high-grade resistance to, this patient had uh, evolved fluconazole and voriconazole resistance. What's happening here is that um, I have, this pair of isolates is a hypermutator in that its DNA mismatch repair mechanism has got nonsense mutations. So this is, this is a fungus that has lost its ability to control its mutation rate. It's hypermutating, but that's conferring an ability to, out, um, to dodge, to dodge uh, this treatment. At least that's what we believe at this stage. And there is a precedent out here because um, Candida gabbrata has been shown to have a very high frequency of these uh, hypermutator phenotypes, up to 30% in clinical populations. Um, fantastic journal Nature Communications, by the way. I believe there's an editor in the audience. Um, so I will conclude here. Uh, with the exception of the polyenes, antifungal drug resistance is a significant problem for the frontline therapeutics that we're using today. And there are me multiple mechanisms out there. So there's a combination of approaches that are needed to be, uh, to, to, to be developed to, to deal with this evolving problem. Um, there's, mount there's, there's very, very good evidence that this azole resistance is being uh, created out there in the environment for some fungi, such as fumigators. But there's also a question, in my mind at least, is about whether patients are also reseeding the environment with their azole resistance um, inf infections. And certainly cystic fibrosis patients are something that needs to be thought about carefully here. And there is a ton of new genomics research that is, is, has been opened by these, uh, these, these disruptive technologies that's going to really increase our understanding of the, the scale and grade of, anti of antifungal resistance out there. So um, thank you very much for listening. I'm bang on time, so uh, thank you.